Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today we'll be watching Who Wants to Live Forever? Frederick the Great Part 5 by Extra History. So I believe this is the last episode in Extra History's Frederick the Great series. I very much enjoyed this series. It's given me an opportunity to talk more about Frederick and talk about the larger trends of the 18th century. So let's end this series off on a high note. Let's jump right into this reaction. The Battle of Pauline. June 18th, 1757. Mm. Frederick's army is running. The uh oh. Four, he well, maybe we're ending it off on a low point, <laughs> not a high point. Invaded neutral Saxony, forcing its troops into his military and snatching the treasury to fund his war effort. Then he'd struck into Bohemia to besiege Prague, but the Austrians caught him there, causing him to split his forces in order to meet the oncoming army. He had struck at them first, as was his style, utilizing his signature oblique attack, where mm. he concentrated his forces on one side of the enemy line. But his troops had been baited into attacking too early, before oh. they were ideally positioned. And look, what I'll say is, I do think Frederick was a great general. I think sometimes his brilliance as a general can be overstated. I think his skill as a general was supplemented by his skill as a negotiator, his skill with international politics, I think that sort of made up for some of his flaws. Not to say he was a bad general, absolutely not, but he certainly made some mistakes. Now, honestly, I think he might have been a better military theorist than actual general on the field. His influence on European warfare is undeniable. I mean, he really shaped the landscape of European warfare. But he wasn't perfect, not to mention... I think Austria, under Maria Theresa, was a fairly formidable foe. Austria often gets the short end of the stick. Uh, they're portrayed sort of badly throughout their history, I think because they often were in a long period of decline, or they were losing battles against upstarts like the Prussians, or at least losing wars against upstarts like the Prussians. But Austria, pretty formidable foe, and Maria Theresa, pretty competent. So, it's not like Frederick swept the floor with his enemies, absolutely not. He faced a lot of challenges. His frontal assault had melted under Austrian firepower, an element not emphasized in his tight marching formations, and now, hours later, the Prussians have lost nearly 14,000 men, and Ooh. they've had enough. Rascals! Frederick strikes out with the flat of his sword, <laughs> shouting at a retreating unit, Do you want to live forever? It's a strange choice of phrase. Because while thousands of troops have... Yeah, 14,000 lost. That is an immense loss of manpower. Uh, I'm not entirely sure how many were fighting on each side of this battle in particular, but 14,000 is a lot. Uh, and also, this was often the role of a field general, whoever was commanding on the field. Uh, I think of uh, an example I'm more familiar with, George Washington, during the American War of Independence. The many times he would ride back and forth, encouraging his men not to flee, sometimes striking them <laughs> with the flat of his sword or his glove in order to communicate to them, hey, don't run away, stand and fight, or I'm going to be mad. That's what Frederick is doing here. You know, a combination of basically threatening your own men, but also inspiring them, encouraging them. And that is what is needed from a great leader. Died for his ambitions. It's actually Frederick himself that will, in fact, live forever. Will he? <laughs> Interesting. His influence will live forever. Thanks so much to Ground News for supporting today's historical tale. The Third Silesian War would give mm. Frederick some of his most legendary victories on the field of battle, but also... And when we talk about Frederick, you know, we talk about the War of Austrian Succession and the Seven Years' War, mainly. But these were composed of many smaller conflicts. If you really wanted to break it down, looking at Europe of this era, you would see constant conflict after conflict of conflict. Uh, but we often group these together under the name of larger conflicts like the Seven Years' War or the War of Austrian Succession, right? So his most catastrophic defeats, with Prussia nearly being wiped off the map. But yeah. these battles were not just important militarily, mind you. They also formed a sort of proto-nationalism, where civilians at home were following, analyzing, and reading commentaries of his battles almost as they would a sport, but more dramatic. Well, we've already described how good Frederick was at communicating and promoting his accomplishments to the public, and that is true for many great generals throughout history. Think of someone like Caesar writing his commentaries on the Gallic Wars uh, and sending them back to Rome to impress all the literate citizens of the city, 
or think about, say, Napoleon. While he was off campaigning, him writing about all of his great accomplishments in dispatches and sending them back to Paris for the newspapers to publish. Uh, this is similar to what Frederick is doing. And that fact really got us thinking in the old extra history lab. Because unfortunately, we don't have time or budget to go through all of his 16 battles. But thanks to my illustrious cat's wonderful suggestion, perhaps we would have the ability to fill you in about it through a different performative art form. Okay. Sports entertainment. Okay, extra Oh, wow. <laughs> Let's get ready to rumble! Interesting way to do it. Hey there, folks at home. I'm Extra History Narrator Matt. And I'm Casual Wrestling Fan Matt. So, <laughs> and we'll be your commentators for tonight. And you know what a night it is in the EH Arena? You said it, Cash Matt. If you remember last week, Frederick invaded Neutral Saxony. A move so aggressive, <laughs> it spawned... We have, you know, European WrestleMania. Seven Years War Edition. <laughs> Four on one match. Prussia against Russia, France, Sweden, and the Habsburgs, leading yeah. much of the Holy Roman Empire. You know, you can only hope that this territory grabbing and attacking neutral allies won't serve as some sort of precedent for future German leaders. But wait, oh, dang, there's the bell. Well, I don't know if this will serve as a precedent for future German leaders, but what I will tell you is that basically every Prussian and then German leader following Frederick has looked back on Frederick and wanted to emulate him as much as possible. Of course, that includes rather famously Hitler, who loved Frederick the Great uh, and really wanted to be him in every way possible. Uh, but aside from just Hitler, this is true of a lot of Prussian and German leaders. You know, Frederick has really been the one to match. All right, opening moves. The Russians have invaded East Prussia. Sweden has entered Pomerania. Oh, big hits. France and Austria are dancing into core Prussian territory too. Huh, looks like a partition of Prussia. Oh my! Frederick has smashed into the French army double his size. 10,000 French casualties to only 1,000 <laughs> Prussian. Yikes. Yeah, they knocked them. Yeah, this is quite a way to communicate the conflict. But, I mean, what they're getting across is that Prussia is in an extremely precarious position. I mean, really, at one point, it looks like Prussia may be eaten up and dissolved by its neighbors. Uh, and that is not something unrealistic. Take a look at Poland. That's exactly what's going to happen to Poland. It's going to be taken over by its neighbors. They're each going to take chunks of territory until the country no longer exists. This could absolutely happen to Prussia, but through a series of intelligent military and political moves and a good bit of luck, Frederick manages to escape. I'm right out of the ring. Looks like now they're hanging back outside the ropes. But wait, Frederick's dashed over to the Austrians in Silesia now. Again, a force twice his size. Is he jabbing at their left side? Oh, ho, 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 sucker punch from the right. Oh, that is a third <laughs> of Austrian forces gone. Two major victories in one month. That is impressive. But Russia's entered Brandenburg. Looks like Fritz is fighting them off, but... Oh, we were expecting this. Here come the Austrians. Oh, surprise attack. Mm. Frederick loses 30% of his army in a strategic blunder. Like I said, Austria fairly formidable foe. And they're the one most directly in conflict with Frederick. Now look, basically no European power except maybe the Brits at this point wants Prussia to really become a major player on the world stage. They want to keep them down. They'd rather not have another powerful rival. But this is true for Austria, Austria in particular. I mean, Austria and Prussia are operating in the same lands, you know, the German lands. All of these little German principalities, which are right now part of the HRE, a lot of them are up for a bit of conquering. And so, whatever Prussia takes, that's something that Austria probably would have wanted. And there is the bell. Time to pause for winter. Indeed, indeed. What do you think so far, Cash Matt? Well, I am. I'm going to tell you, I think it's still too close to call, but Frederick has one huge advantage, in my opinion. Three important words. Unity of command. His enemies mm. have to negotiate strategy and coordinate movements between them, communicating with capitals as far away as Moscow, blah, 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 blah. But if Frederick gets an idea, he just gets to do it because he is both king and battlefield general, and that is invaluable. Oh, but that's a disadvantage, too. I mean, look at Hokia. A regular general wouldn't have made that mistake. But since he's king, he doesn't have to listen to his generals. Right, Not right. To mention his experience at Malvitz means he keeps fighting when he should really cut his losses. <laughs> fair, 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 fair. But you know what? I tell you who he should listen to is his brother, Henry. That kid is a much more careful general overall. And dudes... And look, this is the issue you can run into when you, the king, are commanding your army. Uh, even if you are someone as brilliant as Frederick... Sometimes you may be making a mistake. Your idea may not be the best one at the table, 
but since you're the king, you can do whatever the hell you want, and none of your generals can overrule you. And, in fact, they may even be afraid to give you their ideas, depending on the environment you've created. Undefeated, right? Frederick lost, like, what, half his battles? Oh, wait, hate to cut you off, Cash, but it looks like Frederick's talking to the... Frederick's lost, like, what, half his battles? This is something interesting to point out. Frederick lost plenty of battles. If we look at the individual battles, there were plenty of L's that Frederick took. But overall, he always seems to come out on top during these conflicts. And I think it's because, as I mentioned earlier, Frederick is an intelligent guy. He knows how to negotiate and operate politically. And he also knows when it's important to strike. What he absolutely has to do. And he usually doesn't miss those opportunities, even if he's, you know, taking a bunch of other losses. The fight doctor about how to overdose on opium if things get worse. Can we get a uh, mic down there? Okay, uh, how you feeling, Fritz? Fortune has it in for me. Fate, she is a woman, and I am not in that way inclined. <laughs> <laughs> the crowd loves him. Uh, coming out strong in round two, I guess. <laughs> Speak of the devil, there's that bell. Ooh. Man, they are really on him now. Oh, Berlin is open for the taking. Oh, but wait a minute. Russia and Austria seem to be arguing. Yep. Drawing? Boom. Frederick scores a major hit against Austria. Man, though, these fighters, they look exhausted. I don't know how much longer they're going to be able to keep this up. I mean, Prussia's army is down to like 60,000 men. And like, what, the Russians are in Berlin? Yeah. Well, this might be the end for... Oh, my God. Empress Elizabeth of Russia has just collapsed. This is a very big deal. I'll let them say it, then I'll explain it a little further. And who's that picking up the crown? Wow, that is her nephew, Peter III, a huge Frederick fanboy. I even hear he dresses up as Frederick sometimes. That's weird. Yep, Peter III's a weird dude, man. Yep. Well, he switched sides. Yes, so Peter III takes over the throne of Russia. He is a massive Frederick the Great fanboy. He withdraws Russia from the war. Uh, he, he switches sides. There is zero reason for Russia to cut Frederick a break. Russia is absolutely better served sticking with her allies and continuing to fight Frederick. But Peter III, like we said, is a massive Frederick fanboy. He loves German militarism. He is not really that into Russia. He's also a bumbling buffoon. Um, and this, by the way, is one of the decisions that leads to him being overthrown by his wife, who would become known as Catherine the Great, because this is such a bad decision for Russia. Now, it's absolutely fantastic for Frederick. This basically saves his ass. Really? If this didn't happen, I don't know. We don't know what would have happened. Maybe Prussia would have been done for. Maybe not, but it might have been. But he gets saved by this buffoon Peter III coming to the throne, his fanboy, and Peter saves him, basically. Withdrawing Russian troops from Berlin and giving back East Prussia. That is a miracle. Frederick yep. made peace with Sweden as well, and now can focus on Austria. Oh man, what a reversal. I mean, now a Prussian-Russian alliance will do- But wait, oh. here comes Empress Catherine with a folding <laughs> yep. chair! Peter III is proposed. what a slobber knocker! Yep, and that's what I was talking about. Partially because of that foolish decision, and also just being a generally bad monarch, Peter is overthrown by his far more capable, competent wife, Catherine the Great. And now she's throwing up the deuces. <laughs> Russia is out of the war. Wow, what a great move from Catherine. Oh, wow, true that, my friend. I think we're going to be hearing more from her in the future. Now it looks like the ref is bringing yes. out the negotiating table. Oh, yeah, there it is. That is the end. There is the bell. And seven years of war in Europe has ended. Indeed, <laughs> tens of thousands dead to affirm that check here oh yeah uh, all the borders go back to where they were before the war yes i mean what really happened was that prussia was able to cement its territorial gains this is a good outcome for prussia on paper nothing changed but like i said what actually happens is prussia cements its new territory the seven years war was an immensely consequential war um, maybe i'll get another opportunity to talk about it if we have a video or a series on the seven years war but what it did was it basically bankrupted most of the European great powers, leading to a lot of attempted, some successful reforms in the countries where reforms weren't successful. We can look at France. This sort of snowballs into a revolution for a country like Britain um, because they spent so money, and a lot of that money was spent protecting their colonies in America. 
they try to tax their colonists. And what does that snowball into? Well, the American Revolution. I mean, you can really see how the Seven Years' War leads to a lot of incredibly important events in European and American history. So, incredibly consequential war, but I'll leave it that for now. Well, that was pointless. Night, folks. Man, I wish I was taught history via wrestling in school. Uh, where were we? Oh, yeah. Prussia survived with its conquests intact, but barely. Plus, yeah. Frederick was in no less danger. He'd had six horses shot out from under him during the war, and the years of campaigning had aged him. Shaken by how close he'd come to ruin, Frederick would avoid war for the rest of his reign. And, and you know, that might be a good idea. Uh, we can see how war has benefited Frederick in Prussia. It's allowed them to expand their territory and cement themselves as a major player in Europe. But it has also brought Prussia incredibly close to being completely destroyed by its enemies. So maybe it's best to sort of step back from the warfare. And that's not, you know, that's even without mentioning the immense amount of death and destruction brought by these wars that Frederick purposefully waged. I mean, if you want to look at it from a, say, moral perspective, and this is how some people looked at it at the time, so this is not me putting, you know, modern morality onto something that happened a couple hundred years ago. People were saying these kinds of things in this time period. In order to expand his territory, expand his power, Frederick, the warmonger, started a bunch of conflicts that would lead to the deaths of tens of thousands. Is it worth it? You can ask yourself that question, but it's definitely something to think about. And, you know, I kind of hate that we're saying it like that, the rest of his reign. Because Frederick actually did so much domestically, but it is yeah. hard to balance that story amid his battles. Frederick's rule was one of centralization. As an enlightened absolutist, he believed... I mean, this is true. I, I think oftentimes Frederick's domestic policy sort of gets lost in the battles, the wars, the treaties, which were sort of more consequential for broader European history and are a little bit more flashy. But Frederick's domestic policy was super important for Prussia itself and also very influential throughout Europe. I mean, a lot of different intellectuals, a lot of different rulers, politicians took cues from what Frederick would do in Prussia. A strong monarch was necessary to push forward Enlightenment ideals in government policy with a king as servant and first citizen of the country. He yep. reformed Prussia's legal code. And this is how Frederick framed his own rule, which was fairly unique at this point, though a lot of other leaders would then pick up on this framing. Frederick said he was the first servant of the people. Before this, there was a lot of monarchs who framed themselves as this God-ordained ruler who should have absolute authority because God had granted it to them. People are not involved in this equation. It's about God giving power to to the king, to me, and that's why I deserve to rule. Frederick removed that. He said, no, I deserve to rule because I serve the people and my power comes up from the people. Now, I still hold absolute authority, don't get me wrong, but I am here to serve the people. You know, this was one of those enlightenment ideas that Frederick didn't come up with, but he spoke it very publicly, and he ruled in that fashion. And like I said, a lot of people would sort of take after Frederick in that respect. ...to mostly eliminate torture, and repealed most capital offenses, so only a handful of executions occurred each year. He opened yep. government positions up to those of lower social ranks, and started an organized grain storage program in order to keep food prices stable and provide bread during famines. Also, as a patron of the arts, he funded philosophers, artists, and musicians, mm -hmm. personally composing... And as we mentioned in previous episodes, Frederick funded the arts, and he also allowed Prussia to be used as sort of this free speech zone. <laughs> so if philosophers, artists, writers had gotten in trouble in their home country, maybe they had gotten in trouble with the censorship office or the government... They were able to flee to Prussia and continue their writing or their controversial art, whatever it may be. 121 sonatas and four concertos with the flute. And when Johann Sebastian Bach visited the court, the two actually had a jam session. <laughs> and all the while, he was still prolifically writing histories, poems, and books yep. on battlefield tactics. He also reformed Prussian agriculture by reclaiming Prussian forests and draining swamplands. And while potatoes were already present in Germany as animal feed, he actually recast them as food fit for human consumption. 
And, of course, potatoes would be an incredibly important food that would really fuel Europe's population explosion over the next couple hundred years. But on Frederick's reign, now look, Frederick was not trying to implement democracy. He was not getting rid of the aristocracy or social classes or any of that kind of stuff, right? He ruled as an absolute monarch, and he also approved of the essential hierarchy of Prussia. But he definitely did serve the people in many ways. You know, he passed policy that was beneficial to the vast majority of people. He opened up a lot of positions, um, more to meritocracy than to just people who had a noble background. He was, in many ways, a servant of the people. He was seen as the people's king, and people recognized him for that, you know. But like I said, don't get ahead of yourself. Don't be thinking democracy and all that kind of stuff. Absolutely not. Frederick wanted all the power for himself, but with that power, he did do some things to help the people of his country. Convincing Prussians that they were valuable by sending royal guards to stand around potato fields. Hmm. Then in 1772, in one of his most notorious and consequential actions, he managed to avoid a renewed war with the Habsburgs by proposing that Prussia, Austria, and Russia carve up Poland between them. Eat. Yes, and this is another thing which of course, was incredibly beneficial for Frederick, but <laughs> if you're looking at the morality of the situation, you may not necessarily approve of. This is the first partition of Poland, and I've I mentioned it several times. I mentioned it earlier in this video, exactly what they said. What happened is the Poland-Lithuanian Commonwealth had been a very powerful empire in Central and Eastern Europe, but over time, it had declined a lot. At this point, it was basically at rock bottom. And so what Prussia, Russia, and Austria did, and this was proposed and pushed by Frederick, is that they just took some of its territory for themselves. And Poland couldn't do anything to fight back. And then, a couple years later, they said, well, why don't we take more territory? And you can kind of see where this goes. Eventually, in only a couple of decades, what these three powers do, Prussia, Russia, and Austria, is they take all of Poland's territory and so there no longer is a Poland. There is no longer a Polish state. Uh, of course, this was great for those three powers. It was very bad for Poland and the people of Poland. And from this point onwards, the people of Poland would be in an almost constant struggle to establish their own state. Now, Napoleon established a Polish puppet state during the Napoleonic Wars. That was probably the best they would do up until very recently. There is the uh, Duchy of Warsaw, Congress Poland it was called, established following the Congress of Vienna in 1815. It got absorbed into Russia. Then, of course, following World War I, Poland gets its own independent state, but then it's invaded by the Nazis and the Communists, and then it's a part of the Soviet bloc, and then, you know, fast forward 1989. <laughs> you know, in the last couple of decades, Poland finally gets its own independent country, that it still has up until this day. But as you can see, this began a real long period of struggle for the Polish people. Each taking a large piece. Now, there was, of course, no justification for this action, which was against the will of the vast majority of my own ancestors. But in doing <laughs> so, he did gain the Poland-held province of West Prussia. Uh, and that's why I wanted to point this out. You know, this is often just seen as a political move which empowers these three countries, particularly Prussia. But it's worth remembering that this really started uh, a very long period of struggle for the Polish people. And if you're Polish or you have Polish ancestors then you're absolutely not going to like this at all, right? So I think it's worth pointing out. Finally making him the king of Prussia rather than <laughs> king in Prussia. Yeah. Uniting his expanded territory. Frederick had no children, for obvious reasons, having spent most of his later life with his personal valet, who had a bedroom next to his. Mm -hmm. And when he died in 1786, at the age of 74, his kingdom went to his nephew, and his body went into a vault next to his abusive father, even though he specifically requested to be buried at Sanssouci next to his greyhounds. Wow. Enough, Frederick left an odd legacy, Jeez. since his contradictory personality meant people could read whatever they wanted into it. Yeah. And here's the thing, a lot of us look at Frederick and see a contradictory personality. And Frederick was a man of many different things, but I think to Frederick himself, none of it was contradictory. You know, we might look at Frederick and see a contradiction between, on one hand, his warmongering, all of the people he killed and 
all the people, his actions led to dying. And then, you know, his enlightened philosophy, the arts, uh, his domestic policy, a servant of the people, we may see them as contradictory. Frederick did not. Um, and some people at the time saw these as contradictory. There was criticism from some Enlightenment thinkers, but others also viewed them as non-contradictory. So it really depends on your perspective. German nationalists revered him as a national hero, ignoring that he cared nothing about a wider Germany and despised German language and culture. During the <laughs> Weimar Republic, Berlin's <laughs> rising gay culture adopted him as a symbol, and he was also a favorite of Hitler, who just That's exactly right. As I mentioned earlier, Frederick was a big figure in German nationalism, and for Hitler in particular, Hitler revered Frederick the Great. Fied his expansionism with Frederick's historical example. Though, to be clear, Frederick had zero interest in ethno-nationalism. His... Right, I mean, Frederick was kind of before that time anyway, but if we even look at what Frederick thought about German identity or culture, even though these things were rather nascent compared to what they would become, we can see Frederick was far more of a Francophile. <laughs> he liked French culture and French art and literature far more than he did German culture. So if you really take a look at that, then... You know, not very nationalistic, at least not for Germany. Um, but of course, people can interpret him however they want, and historical figures often get interpreted in a way that they might not like in the future. Reputation fell as a result after World War II, though historians began reappraising him after German reunification, which was when his grave was finally moved to Saint Souci as he wished. Oh, that's but nice. He I mean, an association with Hitler is always toxic. So, this is true. After World War II, Frederick the Great was kind of a toxic figure because he was so closely associated with Hitler. So, of course, no one wanted to praise him or study him or whatever. But as time passes, you know, we can sort of more see the truth of the situation, which is, it's not Frederick's fault he was a favorite of Hitler, right? <laughs> there is no real association there. And so now we have a far more positive view of Frederick than we might have in, say, 1950 received no greater compliment than that from Napoleon himself, who, when he defeated the Fourth Coalition, paid a visit to Frederick's tomb. Gentlemen, he said, if this man was still alive, I would not be here. Wow. That's not a legacy. I don't know what is. Yeah, I mean, coming from Napoleon, one of, if not the greatest conqueror of Europe, that's pretty damn impressive. Napoleon saying, hey, if this guy was still around, he would have stopped me. That is high praise that Napoleon didn't usually offer. So that really shows you how much of an impressive character Frederick was. Uh, all right, fantastic. Uh, I enjoyed this series. It was very interesting to talk about the reign of Frederick the Great, his accomplishments both on an international stage and in Prussia itself, his domestic policy, uh, also how we could examine larger European trends through the character of Frederick the shift towards the Enlightenment, these enlightened despots, many of which followed in the footsteps of Frederick, the Seven Years' War, all of the consequences it had for, frankly, the world. A lot of stuff to talk about, uh, and a lot of it Frederick himself was involved in. So yeah, uh, I had a good time with this series. If you guys did, I'd appreciate it if you would leave a like, subscribe, check out the Patreon, which is linked down below. That will give you access to exclusive reaction content. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, I hope you guys are having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.